There it is. All right. Hello, everyone. Eric Marks here with FindingMiddleEarth.com. And today I am live with the one and only Mr. Mark Puckett from the Photo Video Show. So just in case anyone from my channel doesn't know who you are, Mark, give yourself a little intro and background on your channel and everything. All right. Well, first of all, I'm trying to pull up your live chat because it's literally like no notifications whatsoever. But anyway, um, I am Mark Puckett from the Photo Video Show. I've been on YouTube for uh, like a lot of years. Um, and I'm also uh done a lot of switching apparently according to some people it's like mark you switch too much because i recently just picked up a fuji xt2 and uh now i'm in the fuji fam so what's up fam yeah but, that's the uh, only reason i have you on the channel if you were still shooting sony i wouldn't allow you on the channel so it doesn't <laughs> right <laughs> no i'm just kidding so so how long have you been shooting with your xt2 now officially like as a as a like, personal like, ownership of like, the a, like an official date yeah. when i became adopted into the fuji family is like i don't know um when did i order it I really I can't remember, but I would I'm guessing that it's like right around two solid weeks. Okay. Of cool. So yeah, I, so I talked to you. Okay. So yeah, I talked to you on your channel and you were still kind of, you know, getting used to everything. And now that I've been seeing a ton of your black and white photos pop up and you're getting <laughs> a lot of shooting in with it, uh, oh, yeah. what are your like do you have any more likes or big dislikes that you've found with it since you're shooting with it like every day? Um hmm. Well, I, I want to do more video with it. I really do. And I keep testing it. Uh, I keep going back and forth with the testing as far as video is concerned. On the still side, I really, I can't find much to hate about this camera. Like there's really so much uh, juicy goodness built in here. I, I really, I'm having a really tough time nitpicking this thing at all, except for the video, you know. Um, other than that, no, I mean, I, this camera is just straight up love. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so so all your black and white photos have been with the acro simulation, I'm assuming. So ever since I've been some seeing them, that. So some of them because they? I don't process I don't process every raw file um in in camera. So sometimes I just have to kind of convert it over to black and white and then tweak it, you okay. know, in an external editor. But um any anything that I like uh, anything that I process directly in camera, I mean, it is love, except for the contrast. I like to mess around with the contrast a little bit extra, but yeah, I noticed. And you're so so you have been playing around with just the the Fuji JPEGs like straight out of the camera, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's half they're the reason fantastic. why this damn camera. <laughs> yeah, they're they're fantastic. Um, yeah. So the since you've been shooting black and white, it got me thinking about uh, a lot of people have, have emailed me recently. And since I'm a landscape photographer, I mean, in any, in any genre of photography, light is everything. But when you're a landscape guy like me, you know, like outside natural light, you just have to pay attention to the direction of the light, the shit, you know, the shading, the contrast, everything. So right. um, what I noticed was a lot of people have been emailing me about the past month or so saying, so, you know, I get how to use my camera. I'm starting to understand composition. How, how do I understand lighting? You know, how, how can I be taught that and I started thinking you know it if you shoot black and white for like a straight month you will understand lighting better than you ever have because really black and white is nothing more than the contrast on Correct. where the light is hitting so that's that's one thing that I'm sure you've noticed as well shooting more you just you really understand more of where the lights hitting and the way it, it creates the shadows in your composition and you can really use the light to better the photo yeah uh, that's that's probably the biggest draw uh, as far as black and white is to me is because I remove when I shoot black and white, which I mean is 100% love for me as far as black and white goes. I mean, even when I shoot film, I usually buy native black and white films, but it is 110% just the highlights and the shadows, the dance between the darks and the lights. And, um, when you shoot black and white, you remove all the distraction of the color. You know, you don't worry about color shifts or odd hues or reflected light off the grass or just all those other kinds of things. And you, you get to basically play more a game of chicken with yourself and the sun and how things are going to be falling and where they're going to be falling and uh, what the gradations are going to look like. And it's a completely different uh, process. And it's, it's one that I actually really, really love. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I, yeah, whenever I don't shoot black and white enough, but I did for a while. And that's why I brought up the whole understanding lighting thing. Because when I when I shot black and white, I did it so that I could really understand the way light you know falls in certain areas. And yeah, one thing I noticed is that it's literally you're just processing the light, like you said. You're not worried about color or you know the the gradations between between you know blue and contrasting blue with white. It's just shifting the light one way or the other. So right. yeah, it's a very useful tool. So let me check the chat window real quick. Um, 
What's up? I just Andrea? got in the chat room. So <laughs> yeah. Jose says, uh, "Hey guys, did you already use the 50 millimeter f2? Have you ever used the Fuji mil the Fujifilm 50 f2?" I played around with it in the camera store, but that was about it. I was a little bit more enamored with the 56 one two, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. No, I have absolutely. Yeah, because it's 1.2. So it's 1.2. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I haven't, again, I've only had to play with it in the, in the camera store as well. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't played with it. I have the 35 millimeter F2, which I love. And then I had the 56 1.2, but mm -hmm. I sold it off because I was jealous that you have the 16 millimeter 1.4. Oh my God. You sold the 56 1 2 for the 16 millimeter. Yeah. Well, I haven't gotten the 16 millimeter yet. I'm going to, <laughs> but yeah, I sold it because when I, when I saw it on your camera and I keep seeing your black and whites of the cityscapes, I'm like, gosh, I have to get rid of this 56 because I only use it on my daughter and right you know I, I don't really i don't do like professional portraits anymore so well, yeah i think i'm gonna end up getting the 16. okay uh, well, so let, let, let me tell you a little bit about it uh yeah and, and how amazing this lens genuinely is okay so here's the 16 millimeter uh this is the f 1.4 um the reason that i think that i am i don't i am in lust like hardcore with this lens because it is so ridiculously versatile uh, because it's a 16 millimeter on the APS-C uh, form factor or the sensor size, your hyperfocal distance is so short, it makes it so easy to get everything in focus. I mean, uh, it, it, I shoot everything pretty much wide open so I can get the maximum hyper, hyperfocal distance, you know, really, really short. I think it's only about 10 meters or so. Um, and <laughs> it's so easy to get huge wide either landscapes cityscapes or anything like that completely in focus no big deal um but on the APS-C body it is effectively a 24 millimeter right. and because it's a 24 millimeter it actually makes it a really good all-purpose lens it's not quite a 35 you know and all that kind of stuff but you can still do portraits with it you can do group shots with it um but this lens also does the extreme close focusing i mean it has i believe a close focusing distance of about six inches so, I mean, it literally can do almost anything. And yeah. for, for the price point of, you know, right around $1,000, it's also got the clutch and everything. So you've got really precise manual focus because the resistance on it is heavy enough that you got a really good, uh, uh, you know, feel for like where you're going to be at in the focal range or in the focus range. Um, but it's, it's smooth enough that you could easily do in video too. And that's the reason I want better video functions on the X-T2 because this lens would just be awesome sauce for, for any, any type of video. But yeah, I absolutely love this lens. And if you do buy it, uh, it's going to be immediate love. You'll, you're never getting rid of that lens. Yeah, I know. That's, well, yeah, one, one thing that really intrigues me about it is the super close focusing distance. Yes. I think yes. a lot of people use it as kind of like a, like a wide-angle macro for like wedding rings and stuff. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. I use it all the time for detail shots when I'm doing uh, like uh, – like reviews of products and stuff. So if I want to get something that's, I mean, just really, really close. I mean, you do have a little bit of an issue sometimes with the light because you will cast a shadow on it if you get too close. But other than that, I mean, this the lens is awesome. It's absolutely it worth every single penny because yeah, it's so personal. Uh, yeah, I've heard. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'd love to use that lens for video too. And so for me, um, I think we've talked about this too. I think Fuji has it's definitely improved a lot in video from yes. previous models. But, yeah. Uh, I think it would be really nice if it had like a, a legit face tracking in video like you were talking about. That would be really nice because I have noticed that the continuous autofocus for like vlogging purposes is really good. Yeah. But it doesn't know, you know, to, to actually track the face if you're, you know, doing like a, a you know, like gorilla style vlog, you know, just doing like a run and gun shoot. So, yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else you'd like to see other than like the face tracking for you? I mean, I just do like YouTube videos and vlogging stuff. And I mean, for professional work, I wouldn't really know what to ask for. Well, okay, um, as far as I can tell, um, the face tracking works actually pretty damn good in 1080p. Um, it's not like, it, it, it's not just pit bull hang on tight like the Sonys are though. So, um, you know, if you do a lot of guerrilla style filmmaking where it's like ENG or if it is just this really hectic, you know, swoop over to the face and then hurry up and swoop back to the action type of uh, filmmaking, um, yeah, it's probably going to struggle more so than the Sony cameras will. But uh, another thing that I really, really like about um, especially the 18-55 to kit lens on this thing is that the OIS 
for the Fuji system, even though the camera does not have in-body image stabilization, the OIS is really, really great. So if they ever made a lens with the same level of image quality, like the 16 millimeter with OIS, and they could ever nail down that, I mean, it, it really would be uh, probably... I mean, it's already the best APS-C camera on the market, period, hands down. That, that I'm just going to yeah, say it. I agree, yeah. Um, yeah, if, if they ever did, I mean, so the, that's kind of the biggest struggle with people. I, I've done a, a couple of videos, like, uh, comparing the 16 to 55 2.8 with the 18 to 55. Um, uh, it, it's a hard comparison because it's, 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 not just an image, it's not just an image quality comparison. It's also uh, size because the 18 to 55 is much nicer to just throw in the bag and take out for like a street camera for the day. Whereas right. the 16 to 55 is, you know, almost the size of a 24 to 70 on a DSLR. Mm -hmm. um, and it's much heavier. So yeah, I've done a few comparisons and the OIS, like you said, is definitely incredible on the Fuji system, but there is a noticeable image quality difference between 18 to 55 and 16 to 55. Right. But again, it's, by the time, you know, if you're going to add sharpening and, and as long as you're not going to print, you know, like 40 by 60, it's not going to matter that much to people that don't print large. So, you know, I think there's a lot of people that get too into the megapixel and image quality war when they're just like throwing it up on Facebook and like a square, you know, Squarespace portfolio or whatever. Right, it's not, right. You're not going to see, because like what, you know, me and you, do you have, you have the iMac 5K, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, I have the iMac. It's 5K. the only way to edit. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, gotta... I have the five K as well, right? So, but even the five K is only like what, like a fourteen megapixel screen when you when you add the dimensions up. So, right. You know, you know when I'm shooting with my D810 or even the XT2 at twenty four megapixels, you're never going to actually see all those megapixels on the screens yet. So, you know, you can get a hundred megapixel image, and you're really not going to enjoy that until you see it on you know like a one hundred you know I don't know like a twenty foot, thirty foot, forty foot wide print or something. So. Right. Right, speaking exactly. Of printing, speaking of printing, by the way, I saw you yeah. got a, a new toy. I do, I do. Um, so I, I put out a vlog for Saturday uh, because my local camera store uh, had a fantastic deal on the Canon Pixma Pro 10, which is about a seven or eight hundred dollar printer. Um, of course, we all know that most of the time the camera companies and stuff they make all their money on the the comeback they're like drug dealers they like they give you the free sample and then they they wait for you to come back with the the ink and the paper and all that stuff yes, but um cool. so they had it for 50 bucks though of course it was with a 200 dollars rebate so i'll get that on an american express gift card here in a little while but um i don't care and um so what how how, how large have you printed with it so far i think so that one can print what like 13 by 19 right as far as I know, that's the largest that it can print is 13 by 19 prints. Yeah, and, and what you have the Pro 10 model? Is that what the, it was? Yeah, the Pro 10. Yeah, now, so I, I, have the Pro, the, I have the Pro 100 over my shoulder. And oh, okay. you, can, you can see I, I use it so often because it holds all of my Fuji, my Fuji <laughs> Castle of boxes there. So... Yeah, it's because a like you said, fantastic box holder, man. Because <laughs> like you said, after you run out of ink, it's like 130 or 140 bucks for the ink, and then right. I can just use my Smug Mug membership to order prints for cheaper than that. So yeah, but it, I mean, for seriously though, for printing at home, it is fantastic. It prints really nice quality image or prints for uh, for an in home printer. I mean, it's really nice. Well, here's the thing. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of people going, man, I wish we could get that deal. You know, blah blah blah. Wherever I'm at, I've had I had one guy say, man, I wish we could get that deal in. Australia, dude, you bugger. I can't believe we can't get that deal in the UK. Um, and so <laughs> the, the ink is expensive. I'll, I'll grant you that. But when I consider say like the last three gallery showings that I've had where I've had my work hanging up in the galleries and I had to go and take, uh, me and my creative director will kind of pick out what, which images we want in the show or whatever. And then we have to send them off. Uh, I use a, a company called blue cube imaging, they use really, really beautiful high gloss Fuji archival paper. It's absolutely gorgeous. But in nine times out of ten, he wants large format. He wants like 16 by 24 or whatever it is. And it's just huge. So each print alone is roughly 20 bucks. And if I did, you know, 10 or 15 of my images in the show, I mean, there's like, you know, it's like five hundred, six hundred dollars to get yeah. all of those into the show. Um, but I also think too. I would probably put more of my own work in my own house if I own this printer. And at $134, it is a hell of a lot cheaper for me to print what I want, you know, here at, here at home than having to, you know, send it off or get it processed and get it rolled back. And I don't know. I think it's, um, it's expensive for someone that doesn't like prints or doesn't print at all. Any new cost would seem expensive. 
But, you know, when you do it uh, for a living and you put your prints up in galleries or, you know, when you want to maybe just start giving your prints away as gifts or whatever, it, it makes it so much cheaper to just go ahead and buy it that way. So, yeah. and as a matter oh, of yeah. fact, I did well, want to say. Yeah. Have you used any of the uh, just really cheap matte paper that Canon makes? Uh, yeah, I have. That I think it, it mine came with like 50 sheets of it or something. And yeah, okay. I, that's, what I, that's what I did my like test printing on. Okay, so have you tried printing any color on it? I, I don't find the color to be all that phenomenal on that paper. But the black and whites, perfectly usable, especially with my film shots. So Yeah, yeah, I've tried. So the, the paper I use now is the Canon Pro Luster, the, uh, the yeah, 13 by 19. But I've never really found any good paper other than like, a, like one of the really shiny like pearl sheen papers or whatever. Yeah, that, like, uh, that, that literally like yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't really find that any of them really make the color pop. And that's why I don't know if you I don't know if you were able to to check that video I sent you about the how I prep my photos for print in a really nerdy way. You have to like you have to like crank the saturation of the vibrance up ten or fifteen percent to just compensate for when ink hits paper, some weird stuff happens. It, you kind of lose luminance levels, you know, you right. lose a little bit of the color. For black and white, you know, it's not it's not quite the same. You'd, the you know, I mean the the more contrasty and the more blacks and crisp shadows you can get, the better. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming, or well, not assuming, it's a fact that if you shoot black and white, it's, it's not going to cost you as much in ink because you're just shooting black and white. Exactly, exactly. I only have to buy like three things. I have to buy, uh, buy the, uh, the gray, the black, and the chroma um, enhancer, and that's it. Everything else, I mean, it can, I mean, it's still full right now, and I've made like, this is one of the prints that I did on that, uh, on that matte paper, and in black and white, I don't know if you can see that very well. Oh, yeah. But nice. even hanging up on a wall. I've got uh, I've got a larger size of this hanging up on the wall now that I just printed out yesterday, and I mean it, it looks fantastic. I, I also printed out a, a photograph of my grandmother. I did a portrait of her um, on film, so the gradations of the film and the the film grain and everything, while not as good on this paper as it probably could have been on like the Pro Luster, um, it still came out really really good. Nice. Yeah. Well, one, one thing about printing in general, which so many people are getting away from printing in this, you know, digital age of stuff. It's like the second that you see your work from a file to an actual tangible object. Like yes. for me, the first time I did it, it was like, it was just a, a magical moment. I mean, it was, I was, I finally was like, Oh, right. This, you know, my photography can be art because yeah. I actually have this in my hand now. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to sell people on photographers being artists sometimes that don't understand because it's just a digital file for Facebook, Instagram, whatever. But right. you know, when you see these, these big prints and these beautiful, I mean, the, the way you can, can make them look and literally have a tangible object. You can frame them nicely, put them in a gallery. I mean, it really is, it's a magical experience to see something you took from start to finish as an actual physical thing you can hold in your hands and sell or share with others or, you know, whatever it's a uh, printing is just one of my favorite things to do. Cause it, that's kind of like the last step for me to really like complete, you know, my favorite portfolio shots. See, I'm not much of a religious person, you know, and I don't really have a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, I don't give a lot of credence to like uh, incantations, you know, saying something and making it so. But it, there is something very uh, invocational about taking a digital file and then putting that and transferring that ethereal idea. It literally it started up here in your brain. It transferred over into action where you click the shutter button, you adjust the lighting, you get the composition just right, and it, and it all started up here, and then you transfer it all the way down into a print. And then you frame it, you mat it, you hang it, and you put it on the wall. And you finally start seeing people actually just stop. You know, they will stop and they will look and they will uh, examine it and try and understand the thought process behind the composition and the lighting and the subject matter and all that stuff. Whereas I don't find that hardly anyone does that with digital files for some reason. Yeah, because, no, it's true. Because I know that I don't. I mean, I, 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 I see some amazing gorgeous beautiful things uh like on my 500 pixels account uh, there are some of the best photographers i've ever seen on that website and i am just absolutely blown away but i can literally spend roughly five to six seconds looking at that image and then i will swipe right past it and never give it a second look but as soon as i walk into a gallery or even just look at the pictures on my own wall at home i mean i just want to stop and just go dude that looks dope as hell you know like that is awesome <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, so the whole, yeah, like you said, the whole printing process is just a magical thing in general, but yeah, when you, I think it, what's crazy is like you said, when I have looked at photos, even my photos 
on on the screen and I'm like you know they're okay I guess I'll print it out to see how it looks and then when I print it all of a sudden it just went from like a one star image to like a five star and I fall in love with it I don't know why it just You're happened because right, you know? it's like now that it's here in my face I can start to like I'm almost asking myself questions about the story behind the photo even though I was there taking it and exactly. that's, what, that's what it's all about is making people like you said just stop think you know what's the story question what's happening in the photo what's funny is sometimes some of the worst digital photos make the best prints it's, I don't I don't get it but it's true. No, it is 100% true because uh, I, I've even had some questionable photographs that I've taken. I'm like, oh my God, this thing is such a piece of shit. There's no way I'm going to show this to anybody. And then as soon as I get it on a beautiful piece of paper uh, with some, you know, absolutely amazing processing, it just, it completely transforms my opinion. It's just like, but why though? Like what, what happened? Like it wasn't that good, but now it's amazing. You know, I don't know. There is something transformational that happens going from, you know, print or digital to print. Right. All right. Let me uh, catch up on some of the comments yeah, you got here. A bunch. I, just, I know some of them flying <laughs> you in. You got me, a bunch. I know, let me scroll back to it. All right. So uh, Rob from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia says, Hey, I'm here as a landscape photographer. Lately, I've been shooting a lot of black and white and street style. I've been considering the 23 F2. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, the 23 F2 is probably like the bread and butter for a street photographer because it, it ends up uh, like an equivalent 35 millimeter lens on full frame. And that's what most street guys love. So, I mean, they just like crank their aperture and like F like F5.6 or F8 manual focus out to infinity. And then you just point and shoot. It's basically a point and shoot camera. So yeah, 23 F2 is extremely sharp as well. And as it's snappy as hell. Yeah, it is. And, and it's just, it's teeny tiny. And yeah, the, all the F2 lenses are so snappy with the autofocus. So yeah, 23 F2, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Jose says, hello, fan of both channels. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Chad Sifford says, check out the Instagram handle, Chad Sifford, plug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rob, I have, okay, he's talking to Rob. Let's see. Um, uh, hi, Rob C. Ontario here. Uh, I like the 10 to 24 for street walk around. Uh, yeah, so you don't, you don't have the 10 to 24, right? You, you do the 16. That, that's the one. Is that the only wide you have? Me? Yeah. Yeah, that's the only, uh, well, the, and the only reason I only want this one, uh, I've heard some bad things about uh, the 18 millimeter, even though I don't necessarily think I would hate it because of its small size. I'm kind of holding out to see if they end up releasing that 8 to 16 millimeter next year. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, got you. Yeah. So the, the, I have the 10 to 24 and I just know immediately compared to the 16 1.4, the, there's, there's actually a quite a big difference in image quality there. I was actually surprised at, um, I, I thought I was going to love the 10 to 24 and it's a really good lens. It's just, it's probably one of the least sharp lenses in my bag. It's almost on par with the kit lens, which is again, isn't bad, but when you have the 16 to 55 or the 50 to 140, you can tell a noticeable, you know, sharpness difference there. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see some more comments. Uh, Chad says, what do you guys think of the Nikon D810 replacement being a full frame mirrorless with the tracking system of the D500 game changer question mark? Um, I, I have no, I don't know. There's been so many rumors. Like I thought that the D810 replacement was going to be released like last year's Photokina. Um, and I think everybody kind of did. And then when it wasn't, you know, we are all just kind of confused. So I'm not believing anything I hear until I actually <laughs> see this camera now. But I know Nikon's like 100th birthday is coming up in mid-July and everyone's thinking that's when it's going to be released. I assume that's when they're going to do it. Uh, I don't know. Do you think Nikon's going to go full frame mirrorless like right now? <sighs> I don't know. Um, Nikon's in a really weird spot, especially considering the fact that, you know, all those rumors coming out of Japan where uh, the minister of internal finance or whatever the hell it is, is yeah. basically begging Fuji right now to buy Nikon's camera uh, company. They, essentially, they're part of camera co just so that it'll stay in Japan. Right. Um, yeah, I, so, I mean, I really don't know if they're going to make the jump or not and, and start doing full frame mirrorless. But I mean, if they do, I, I if their track record has any level of weight bearing on this particular topic, I don't know if they're going to do very well. I'm almost, <laughs> no, I, I'm almost really afraid that they're just going to waste a bunch of money. I know. Yeah. I, so I, so I don't know. It was kind of controversial when they released the whole, the Nikon DL cameras mm -hmm. that it excited like, you know, four people and then they pulled the release of it. <laughs> right. And yeah. And so, you know, I actually thought it was, I just thought it was kind of <laughs> smart that they pulled the release to save their money. But right. at the same time, you know, I, I'm also cool that they're kind of restructuring. I think it's a good thing, but I don't know. I don't know if they're going to go full frame mirrorless just yet. If they do, you know, I mean, of course I'm going to take a look at it. I'd love to, to buy it and review it, of course, because I've, I've been a Nikon shooter 
shoulder since the day I started photography. So yeah, I mean, I think I think the D810 replacement is going to be a tiny bump in megapixels. They're really going to focus on just making it have a lot better autofocus system, like of the D500. Yeah. Um, I hope it gets better dynamic range. That's kind of shifting one way or the other. A lot of people saying that it won't. A lot of people say that it will. Um, I'm kind of at that point to where I would love to see a camera push like 15 stops of dynamic range. That would be incredible. But I mean, you know, it, it, let's just be honest. I mean, Nikon for the longest time has had the best dynamic range of almost any other camera out there. Yes, um, absolutely. Especially for you landscape photographers, because I mean, the 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 distinction between the highlights and the shadows is always hyper important to you guys. So, um, you know, being able to see into the shadows on the trees and still being able to see the clouds up in the sky. I mean. That's massively important, and Nikon was always the go-to camera. But uh, with the advancements in in mirrorless tech, I mean, I think it's just getting it's getting so much easier to do that. And f from my limited experience with with landscape photography, I, I've only tried a few uh, landscape shots with a uh, Fuji XT2, but the dynamic range optimizer that they have in the camera, which you know will open up those shadows uh, about four hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, I can't complain all that bad. I mean, it is really that damn good. So, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be worth it to Nikon to make that uh, make that attempt or not. So, yeah, because I mean, right now the the D810 is arguably the best. I mean, in my opinion, it's the best dynamic range camera out there right now, at least DSLR. Yeah, and absolutely. It's clocked at like 14.8 stops of dynamic range. So, and that's, it's almost at a point to where you don't have to bracket, even though I do bracket my shots in certain situations. I just feel that if Nikon were to push it just like a little bit more, it might like eliminate the need for HDR, which would be great because I love doing the, you know, exposure blending and stuff. But, uh, you know, the least amount of work I can do on, on the back end, the better. That's um, half the reason I don't shoot landscapes because it's such a pain in the ass. It's just <laughs> such a pain in the ass. I can't control any of the light, yet I have to work <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm working like I literally I don't remember the last time I went to sleep because I've been working on my landscape post processing <laughs> tutorial. So when I, I when I get done, I'll send it to you just so I can have somebody tell me I might have done a good job, so I, <laughs> so I, so I can just get some sleep. Right. Yeah, so you can see because it's not fun. I I spend like it's not fun making it, but it's fun. Like I, I realized during making the tutorial how how horrible it is because it's like. I love spending like the 30 or 40 minutes on the photo doing it. But when I have to like stop and explain it, it's like an eight <laughs> hour video. <laughs> so, right. so I'm like, I've spent the past like four months trying to figure out how to take this explanation and put it into like 45 minute lessons. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, God bless you. All right. So some more comments here. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nicholas, Nicholas Strick says, uh, not liking on one, the crop tool doesn't work. Um, are you saying the plugin? crop tool doesn't work or the actual like full software because i have you had a problem with the crop tool uh, no not in particular I, I all right i have sort of like mixed feelings about on one um i think it's actually really an excellent program um i, I just find that it gets really slow with the raw files at least in in certain situations so um i don't know um the the I, I did test out where you had the photo resize tool. So, you know, I did check that out today so that I could make my photos exactly the size of whatever paper that I was, I was working with. I didn't right. actually print anything out with it yet, but um, I did like that because uh, Apple photos doesn't allow me to do that. It's not exactly an advanced program, but it is a very effective program. I've gotten some of my best shots edited uh, in Apple photos, but I mean, you know, I'm no connoisseur either of, of printing. So you know, piss on me if I'm, you know, just messing everything up. But <laughs> once I get them in my hands, I mean, I, I still think they look good. So yeah, no, I've, yeah. I mean, uh, Apple Photos is actually really good for organizing too. That's where I, that's where actually where I keep my like final portfolio images because it syncs to my iPhone and my iPad, and it's Absolutely. just easy to keep it on there. You know, you pull it up and then you can just here. That's right. That. All right, so these comments are coming in way too fast. Let me get some more here. Uh, Eric Ross. Oh, Eric Ross is here. Uh, he up, says, Eric? "Dang you, Mark, for almost making me go out and buy a printer." <laughs> Dude, just go do it. No, just do it. You'll, just you won't do it. it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Adam Woodhouse says, on one sometimes has bugs on certain systems. Don't know why. I had a major problem with the dot four release and reported it to on one. Uh, problems I had, others didn't, but they confirmed they knew of the bug. Um, yeah, so you know, new software, especially brand new updates, are always going to have bugs. 
Um, and the good thing about on one is they've fixed them. So like the people, some people, when I've released my on one videos, they're like, Oh my gosh, Eric just hopped into the pockets of on one and he's a sellout. <laughs> but, but really the, the, the way that me and on one made our relationship was because I like buried them six feet under when they first released the software. And I thought it was like the worst thing known to man. Right. And then their marketing director comment or uh, emailed me personally and said, thank you for that uh, detailed review. And really, I was like so mean. I felt really bad. And, uh, <laughs> and they were like, we'd, we'd appreciate more feedback. And so I just, I've just been working with them to give them feedback and they've been giving me these beta versions. So, you know, I, I always think that, you know, the more I can do to help, help it, you know, for other photographers, I might as well do it. But yeah, I mean, On One does still have some bugs, absolutely. Um, I wish that they had film simulations that you could see the film simulations for the Fuji files. That would be killer. I'm that sure would. that's all coming. Uh, but I kind of, I guess I asked for it because I released so many on one videos. I pretty much became their tech support over the past like three weeks. Like I wake up every day with like 10 on emails of my viewers being like on one has this problem. Fix it. I'm like, <laughs> I don't work for on one. Like, I would love to help you. So I have, to, I have to email them and be like, look, I, I know people there, so I, I promise I will forward this to the company. But for anyone watching, watching right now, I don't like, you know, On One doesn't pay me or own me, so I can't just like fix the issue. I wish I could because I have issues with On One right now too. I have issues with Lightroom and Capture One. I just kind of bounce around to all of them. But yeah, I promise you that On One is working on them um, and they will release updates as they have told me. So uh, all right, let's see here. Um, Eric Rossi again says, seeing a client use a canvas of mine for the first time was pretty unique as well, different than just paper. Uh, yeah, canvases are actually really cool too. Those are That kind of gives your photo like that painting look. Those are really cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, have you ever, this is just kind of random, but uh, have you ever used the oil paint filter in Photoshop? Or you don't use Photoshop, do you? No, I don't. But I mean, I, on occasion, I do like to use, um, you know, apps and stuff on my phone, at least on my Instagram, uh, you know, just being able to test stuff out. But I would really like to see some of those apps actually translate over onto a desktop. I really would because I find that I can get some just amazingly cool effects with some of these apps. Uh, but unfortunately, it's all on the phone. But if you transfer full size files, you know, from say like your computer or, you know, just do the, um, not, don't do the transfer from the Fuji or, or whatever, cause it downscales it to three megapixels. But if you transfer airdrop from your, your Mac over to your phone, I can get some really cool edits, I think, but yeah, definitely. you know, it's, uh, these files are huge and sometimes the phones start to choke, but I would really like to see some of these images, uh, have the same effects translated over onto a desktop app. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let me read a couple more of these here. Um, let's see. Uh, Adam Woodhouse says, give me more dynamic range or give me nothing. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> dynamic uh, range or death. I know. Uh, Lucas Sangero says, Canon, Nikon, got to do something. The new generation of photographers, people that started with smartphones just won't buy DSLRs. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with that because when when, back when I was like full DSLR, I always thought that it was like the, the hipster guys that just wanted the mirrorless cameras for the vintage look. And they were cute little cameras that were kind you, of... You were one of those? <laughs> yeah. Damn yeah. you, man. You were one of the ones. I know. I was. I was one of the on my channel. I never publicly voiced it, but yeah, okay. I, pr I was probably... I was, I was one of the people that was like, I just don't see it. Mirrorless so you just were doesn't a secret troll. Yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was that guy that sent you all those emails. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I bet. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but I, I agree. I mean, I think that people that that love the whole, you know, smartphone photography just want to, like, up their game a little bit for hobbyist, you know, stuff. They don't want to buy a big heavy DSLR. And so it's just, it's just great in general that mirrorless cameras are getting better and better. And I decided to settle on Fuji because it's just, it's, it's a photographer's camera. I think that it can just do anything. I mean, it's one of the cameras that you don't get it for a specific purpose. It can do some action. It can do some landscape and portraits it just kind of does everything really well it's kind of the jack of all trades camera but at the same time has really good ergonomics a really well thought out menu system and it's just i mean it's a great camera with great lenses and i'm curious to know something about the fuji or i'm curious, curious to know your thought on this because i've i've heard a lot of mixed views on this um sure. a lot of people think that the fuji the fuji xt2 is way too expensive um, I kind of think that compared to what it, well, exactly I, I kind of think that for <laughs> what you get that I, I would probably have paid up to like 1999 like almost two grand for it and while while it would be expensive I mean it kind of makes sense because I paid like $3,300 for my d810 right right I mean 
I mean, it's not full frame, so I would not expect to pay full frame prices. I mean, the E10 is a full frame camera. Uh, so, you know, big, thick, heavy, you know, professional size body or whatever. But yeah, if, for me, I, I think that it was uh, perfectly priced. I mean, there, I, I've spent a whole lot more and gotten a whole lot less. So yeah, yeah compared to what is the question? I agree. Um, well, so I don't remember because I only shot Sony for, I just kind of played in the Sony realm for a while. What is the, like if you, if you wanted like an equivalent Fuji and Sony system, like with the, you, you shot with the what, the A6300? Is that what you? I started off with the A6000. Uh, okay. I tried uh, the A7, the first one, the A7 Mark II, and I tried the first A7R. Uh, um, but then I went on ahead and picked up the A6300 and Sony actually flew me out to Austin, Texas to test out their A6500 and I was not overly impressed. The only thing that really did impress me uh, was the in-body image stabilization, obviously, because it yeah. works really, really good. Um, and the the buffer depth was really fantastic and the the burst speed was, was good. But again, I'm not a sports shooter, so the A6300 was more than enough for me because... I didn't need the depth uh, on the buffer. I don't do a lot of uh, high-speed burst shots. And um, even if I did, I'd probably be shooting in JPEG anyway, so it wouldn't really matter. But, um, but yeah, so uh, right now, I'm still hanging on to my A6300. Um, and as a matter of fact, I still think that the A6000 takes sharper photos in stills than the A6300. But that's just personal opinion. Yeah. yeah. So um, as far as the, the price... Equivalent, if you were to get like I don't know, let's say uh, the Sony A sixty three hundred or sixty five hundred kit Eight. versus the Fuji, if you price it out, the Sony ends up being like worlds more expensive because their lenses are so pricey. I mean, is that in that about right? Well, no, the A sixty five hundred body only is fourteen hundred bucks, and that's that's MSRP. So I mean, that's not probably what you could get it off of Amazon, and it's surely not what you could get it for you know used after a couple of months. Um, but if you got the bundle, you know, uh, whereas the Fuji had the 18 to 55 bundle, which was around 1999 when it shipped, um, I think they ship with the 16 to 50 power zoom, which is okay. roughly about $150 lens inside that bundle. So yeah. it ends up making it just over 1500 bucks. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause well, then I guess I'm just thinking of the, the full frame. Cause I, I had an a 6,000 for a brief time, but I had the a seven R Mark two and the a seven uh, Mark two and the full frame Sony lenses just killed me with their prices. I mean, they yeah, were, they're, they're pretty ridiculously expensive. That's for sure. Yeah. They were, they were pretty crazy. So, and I felt that the quality wasn't there. Now I haven't tried the G master stuff. Those seem really nice. So I'm, I'm sure the G master. Have been I have tried the G master lenses. Um, I've tried their 70 to 200. I've also tried their 85 millimeter. Um, all of which they also provided us samples of when we were in Austin, Texas, testing out the a 6,500. And while all of the images that we took, with those lenses did look absolutely fantastic. They were all full frame lenses on an APS-C body. So naturally they're all going to look amazing. Right. So exactly. I would have really liked to have seen them drop some new, uh, APS-C glass, but you know, that's been half my problem with Sony is that I like being an APS-C, uh, sensor shooter and I don't miss full frame. And I get a lot of people asking me that. As a matter of fact, I just got this douchebag who just left a comment on my channel. <laughs> Is it okay if I say douchebag on your channel? Yeah, that's fine. Douchebag's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't for sure about how clean the audience was here. Um, but yeah, just left a just left a message on mine. And he, I had just put out my Fuji X2 review last week. And um, I happened to say that, you know, I like APS-C, that I don't miss full frame. And... He says, are you a working pro? Uh, I don't think you are from what you said about APS-C. I have both FX and DX from Nikon and Fuji, and I can tell you that the heft and bulk is common in both DX and FX. Do you find that to be the, the case? Um, no, no, I mean, well, first off, I think it's it's kind of crazy that a lot of people say that. They're like, oh, wait, are you even a pro for full? You, know, you, don't, <laughs> you don't have to be a pro to use full frame or APS-C. I mean, I've right. seen, you know, it's, you can, like, it's a camera, you know, with a sensor <laughs> and the the main portion of where the image ends up is all up here. You know, yeah. it's your creativity. It's how you use the camera. I mean, you can, I mean, come on, look at me. I, I was a D810 shooter with like, 12 grand in, in Nikon lenses in my bag. And now I have maybe like a, like a four grand Fuji kit. And that's what I use all the time. And I've used that on, on my paid gigs. I've used it in my personal landscape stuff. And the, again, the only well, like the reason, the reason though is because Fuji doesn't make 
a shit piece of glass at That's all. Right. Like I can't find it, it except for the random, but I've never used it. The 18 millimeter. Everyone says yeah. that it's no good, but I've, I've never I've tried it. Too. So I don't know, but I have yet to pick up a piece of Fuji glass and it be no good. Like right. it's all good. It's I sharp, agree. responsive, fast. I, I can't see any reason to hate the glass. And that is probably the biggest draw for me in the first place. You know, they're even their kit lens blows my mind every single time I, I, I agree. That's why I still have it. <laughs> I mean, because a lot of people say, why do you have the 18 to 55 and the 16 to 55? Again, like it's the OIS is incredible, but just the size of the 18 to 55 is so enticing to just take on like a, like a, you know, a family travel day or something. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's so nice. It's better than every other kit lens out there. It's better than almost every single bit of lower tier, good quality glass that the other manufacturers put out. And it's a zoom. And it's got a 2.8 to f4 aperture. It has built-in optical image stabilization. It's all metal construction. It's made in Japan, and it's small as hell. I mean, there is nothing to hate about that lens. Right, I agree. It's, I mean, it's other than it's the, not an f 1.2 through the whole yeah. focal range. Other right. than that, it's great. Right, and and for the price, I mean, now because there's so many people, I don't get it. So many people that buy the kit and then they'll sell the lens off, and so there's so many of them floating around out there for like three hundred bucks. Which yeah, is and they're crazy. stupid. They are stupid. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, everyone should buy like three of them so that you're never without one. Yeah, well, and especially before they start manufacturing them in the Philippines. <laughs> right. Oh my God, I was I was hoping you would bring that up. How yeah. do you feel about this? I like, feel I, I hate it. So have they actually, I mean, I've not seen any news on this yet, but have they actually announced what lenses they're going to start manufacturing in the Philippines? Not that I've seen, but I, I don't, just in case, like I said, I, I told my wife, I was like, honey, so watch the bank, <laughs> watch, watch the bank account. Cause I might have to buy like four of each lens. Right. <laughs> right. Make sure I get the Japanese versions. Right. Yeah, I, you know, it, it just, and it's not that I have, if there's any Filipino people watching is don't take this the wrong way. I'm just, there's. <laughs> That I just, you know, they don't have the reputation of the Japanese. Don't, don't feel bad. I had to make the same disclaimer on my channel too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just you know, you just know as a photographer when it's built in Japan, you just know it's good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's good quality. All right, so let me catch up on a couple more comments here. Um, SC says, uh, "Just got the XT20, and I really wished I would have gotten the XT2. It is small and nice and all, but I really find it very uncomfortable to hold and shoot." Um, that's funny because my next video actually I'm making tonight is going to be on uh, the X-T2 versus the X-T20 because I've gotten so many emails on that. Have you gotten a chance to play with the X-T20 yet? Yes, I have. Um, yes. As a matter of fact, I contacted B&H uh, two weeks ago when I sent my evaluation copy back for the X-T2 uh, and asked for the X-T20 and the three uh, F2 primes. So, And I also played with it at the camera store uh, probably a week ago or two weeks ago. And I think that it would be fantastic as a secondary camera. Uh, if you were, if you're on the fence between the two, I think that you would only be considering the XT2 if you actually did some hardcore shooting. And the XT2 is the more ergonomic, more powerful, uh, better suited for everything style camera. But if you're just getting started and you want to find a, a door to entry into the Fuji line, the XT20 is off the hook. But right. You know, having the offset screw mount on the bottom that covers up the battery door, that's a hindrance. Uh, yep. It's extremely small form factor. So even if you have, you know, medium sized hands, you might find it a bit crampy. Um, it's a lesser quality build overall. But I mean, as far as just pure image quality, it's going to be exactly the same. Yeah. So definitely. Anyway, yeah, that's, so that, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. Yeah. My, and my thoughts are very similar, except in, well, the, so, so many people, try to like justify them buying it by saying the X-T20 is just the X-T2 for half the price. And it's, you <laughs> it's know, not. no, I mean, it, it's not the X-T2. It's, it's not, it's, it's smaller. It's, it's not, it, you know, I have kind of big hands. So I love the ergonomics of the X-T2. You get the battery grip with the X-T2. You Correct. don't have that option for the X-T20. You don't have dual uh, card slots. Right. You have the single, yeah, just one card slot. Um, the X-T20 does have a touch screen. From what I've seen, it's not like insanely responsive. It's good, but it's, it's not. It's a hell of a lot better than the A6500 from Sony. I'll just put it to you that way. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, well, yeah, I haven't played with that. So yeah. um, I'm afraid if I touch a Sony camera, my finger will fall off. So I, I just, no, I'm just kidding. But, you elitist. <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I haven't played with the a6500, but yeah, I don't know. I'm not big on touch screens. Like I can't, there's, there's a lot of people that like will have, I don't know, I'm a viewfinder shooter and there's a lot of people that say like they'll hold it up and then they'll like thumb around the touch screen while it's in your face. I don't know. I, I can't see me doing that comfortably. 
Um, so you I don't know. But... Be surprised at how well it works. Um, if it's implemented well, uh, I think it's probably a better system than even a, a, a thumbstick or a joystick, to be perfectly honest. Um, like I said, the, the A6500 from the Sony is not very responsive at all. I was completely unimpressed by how laggy that it was, but the X-T20 is actually really good. Um, so, I mean, if you get a chance to play around with it um, and you want to do the, the thumb thing uh, while your eye is up to the, the viewfinder, I think you'll probably enjoy it. But okay. once you kind of get used to doing some um, just LCD screen style shooting, especially if you're not having to worry about it being uh, drowned out by the sun, you might enjoy it. I actually really do enjoy it, especially for video. So, but that's just okay. me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I know it's, again, it's, it's a, it's a great value because it's like $900 and you get a lot of the features and I, I hear the tracking is also really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they have the AFC, like the, the custom settings like the X-T2 does. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure that, or maybe they don't have all of the custom settings that the, XT2 well, they don't allow uh, the X-T20 does not allow you to create a custom AF setting like the X-T2 does. They have basically pre-designed built in yeah. like the X-T2, but no customization for you personally. Right. And then, yeah. So when it comes down to like what, cause a lot of people wonder why I bought the X-T1 as my second camera instead of the X-T20. And the biggest reason for me is the viewfinder. It's like this big on the X-T20 and the X-T1 and X-T2 are like looking into a big screen TV for me. I mean, I, yeah, you know, it is pretty crazy. Cause I mean, even though I found the, um, the, the EVF on the X-T20 to be, you know, really good, you know, for what it is. Yeah. The X-T2 blows it out of the water. I mean, there's just no way that, you would go, oh yeah, these are totally comparable because they're not. I mean, the, the X-T2 really is quite amazing, e even more so than any other mirrorless that I've used. Um, right. There might be some that are pretty comparable, but that one is just like a, a step above all the rest that I've used. Well, I couldn't agree more. All right, let me catch up on a few more of these here. Uh, Eric Rossi says, yep, pro equal FX camera in P mode. <laughs> that's right that's right Eric Rossi. <laughs> yeah p, p mode equal pro <laughs> uh let's see adam woodhouse says uh delusion people think bigger and heavier means more serious uh lucas hungaro says i'll buy a gfx and start leaving comments like whoa you use full frame you must be an amateur <laughs> that's right uh adam woodhouse says p mode equal pro m mode equal master <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andrea says, I used to have a Nikon D750 and got an X-T2. I don't miss the Nikon at all. Yeah, I hear, I hear that a ton, that people don't really miss the full frame. I mean, the only thing I miss about full frame, like the only thing about, I guess, the D810 specifically, is that I admittedly am a little bit of a pixel peeper, and so I would every now and then zoom in at like 400% and just sit there and be Jesus like... Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> Anyone could find something wrong with a picture at 400%. The maximum I generally try to go is like 200%, but... The only time, I swear, I, and this is no joke, the only time I've ever zoomed in 400% is when someone wants me to do an IQ test between two yeah. cameras or something. <laughs> but other than that, it's just like, who the hell's doing that? Yeah. No one is doing that. <laughs> so let me, let me tell you a story as to why I'm, <laughs> I'm haunted by this, why I became a pixel peeper. So <laughs> I, I sell prints, and I sold a really big print one time that I had to ship across uh -huh. the country for this guy. He bought a big print, paid me well for it, okay? And it was a, a picture from uh, Jekyll Island in Florida. There was this big waterway that I did, and I ended up stitching a pano. So the guy ordered a 40 by 60 print for his living room, Holy huge crap. pano stitch, and I shipped it to him. And when he got there, <laughs> I, I didn't see it. So it came from my lab. And when it got there, he sent me a picture, and like way out in the distance, like way out, like probably four or 500%, there was this guy either like fishing or taking a leap <laughs> in the river. <laughs> and he so, can see it yes so oh I'm my like, god this, this guy got a magnifying glass and like checks out the print so i from that and this was years ago from that moment on see, I, it's that guy always, it's that guy yeah that it's ruins that guy. it for and, the rest of us that, that's right and of course that guy ended up being my customer so i had to reship them print of the print obviously after I taking the healing brush tool and making one click <laughs> That's right. Oh, it, oh, it was heartbreaking. It was hard. I brought, brought it into Photoshop. I went into like 400, 500%. I saw what he was talking about, got rid of it. And it was like behind a bush. Like I don't even know how he saw it. So <laughs> I, I got rid of it. I reshipped in the print. All was good. He was super happy and thankful, happy customer. But ever since that, it haunted me. So I like zoom in on everything because you just never wow. know. Yeah. See, it's that guy, man. He's the one that's that ruining it. 
That's right. <laughs> Dude, if All he right. really got a magnifying glass, I would pistol whip that man. I know. I know. Oh my god. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, whatever. He, he's a customer, so I had, you know, got to make got to make customers happy. I wrecked him. All right. So, uh Andrea says Eric Rossi used to join the live chat. Uh I would love that sometime if Eric Rossi wants to do a live chat, we can definitely do that, especially since you know Eric Rossi, Mark. So. All right, let's hook it up. Yeah uh skipper says can you guys email fujifilm and ask them to put on a lens sale uh it's been uh since last december since they had a sale and apparently they're not having another one until september uh, i would love it if i could just shoot fujifilm an email and be like hey hook me up for a few hundred bucks off yeah i've not talked to any fuji reps yet but boy i can't wait to get the conspiracy theories rolling here soon though i know oh i know dude you've been bought out you've clearly sold out how much are they paying you <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm, it's gonna happen <laughs> all right uh let's see adam woodhouse says a, a little of a pixel peeper i know i know 400 percent is like obsessed pixel peeper but when you sell prints you kind of have to be I, I don't know i don't know what else to say um adam woodhouse you have to have that peeing guy in the image that only takes up a few pixels for <laughs> where's waldo bonus of your <laughs> <laughs> that's right i could have just told him it was like a special thing for him and if he found that he got like a bonus print <laughs> he got a free print yeah right. <laughs> a free eight by ten <laughs> uh let's see uh eric rossi says well mark uh we don't call you that fuji guy for nothing <laughs> <laughs> all right i think i'm actually kind of caught up on the comments um oh, that's cool yeah so let's get back to the philippines thing for a second so i i haven't heard any like specific news on the specific lenses but yeah if if they do that i think it's going to be a, a a weird move for fuji because I, I i don't know it's since fuji yeah. and icon and everything in japan is just kind of in a weird place right now i don't know what's going to happen but yeah i it definitely sucks i would prefer everything to stay in japan for sure i i think and this is just speculation i i'm i'm hoping that whatever it is that they end up moving over to the philippines uh it is something maybe having to do with like their ax line you know, the, the smaller point and shoots yeah. or the flip up screen or the more consumer grade stuff. I really hope that they manage to keep their X series, uh, as far as like the X pro to the, uh, XT two, even the XT 20, um, in those types of cameras that use these higher quality pieces of glass. I hope they just, they're putting some cheaper options in the Philippines, but all their main line of stuff stays in Japan with this really nice, you know, metal build quality, uh, there's just no reason i, I kind of this is maybe maybe it's just because i'm still on my honeymoon uh yeah. with fuji or whatever but i almost kind of see them like the um uh the apple of the APS-C line of cameras right now because they they do command a premium but they also provide the premium you know um you just don't hear many people having problems out of this system and you know definitely no overheating um and i know that a lot of times that's overblown on the Sony side, but you know, you just don't hear a whole lot of bad stuff about these cameras. And I would like for them to manage that reputation by remaining in Japan so that there is just one less thing for people to bitch about. You know what I mean? Right. I agree. Yeah, so, I definitely agree. Yeah. So let, let's hope that they keep their, their main X line in Japan. Cause that would yes. make yes. Many more people happy. Um, Including myself. Yes. Oh, absolutely. All right. Let's see. A couple more came in. Um, Let's see. Uh, BDKY says, what do you all consider to be uh, must-have Fuji accessories? Have you got oh. any new fun accessories for your stuff yet? Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly a minimalist, I guess. I mean, I did get you know my shutter release button, my red, because I'm everything is black. I, I love black. And the only accent color that I genuinely, truly love is red. So I had to get that. Um, the battery grip on the X-T2 was a definite, uh, yeah, but it's, it's kind of exclusive to the X-T2, so I don't know if it would be considered a Fuji um, accessory. But uh, other than that, I mean, as far as accessories, I, I think that if you maybe wanted to you know, make your APS-C camera reach just a little bit further, I think the teleconverters that they make are absolutely amazing. And if you <laughs> are a wildlife shooter whatsoever, definitely get those teleconverters. Right. Uh, yeah, and... and I don't know if this really counts as an accessory, but um, I love the Peak Design stuff, the Peak Design oh. messenger bag. Oh, dude, don't don't get me started on my Peak Design stuff. <laughs> yeah, so I I carry this, and I got the little the Peak Design, uh, I guess it's called the slide or the capture. It's called the capture, and uh, this thing just clips the camera right onto the side of the bag, and then I keep one camera in here. And these things are great. This is the little Peak Design messenger bag, the 15 inch version, mm. and yeah, I love that. 
Yeah, so I've got the clutch. Yep. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm thinking about selling it. I don't think that I like it as much as I thought I would. Uh, I have found that I actually like the slide better. The the I cross body well strap. The, the flat, yeah. Yep. Um, and it's not the thin one either. I mean, I, I like a nice thick strap and just hopping on the Segway, zooming around town and just having it kind of slung over one shoulder and being able to reach over and sling it up to my eye real quick has been pretty awesome. And their Peak Design backpack, the 30 liter every day, um, I found that I can fit, you know, just about everything in here, laptop included, and it carries really well. It's a heavy backpack. So let's not get it twisted. This is not like an ultralight pack. And I've always been kind of a stickler for ultralight. And this bag by itself weighs four pounds. So it's not light. Dang, yeah, but it is. Uh, if you are into, say, like, if you have a small drone, like the, the Mavic Pro, if you've got two or three lenses that you want to pack, maybe a body or two as far as your camera is concerned, with your laptop, a few chargers, a couple of dongles. If you're living that Mac Pro, uh, MacBook Pro dongle life, then, you know, you need some some accessories there, but, um, as far as the build quality on, on, the, on the backpack or whatever, yeah, it's off the hook. I mean, it's going to last forever. And I feel a hundred percent perfectly content with the protection that it provides for all of my camera gear. So that was really important. And when you start spending, you know, $1,500 for lenses, uh, and stuff like that, there's absolutely no way you ever want to see that get bumped at the airport or someone accidentally kick that shit and, and ruin probably a month or two's worth of saving up for oh, yeah. that lens to get that. Yeah. I mean, I would just, I would have to choke someone out with a phone cord if I could find one. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the, the, the only other, uh, the only other, like, I guess accessory, it's not really a Fuji accessory, but it's one that I've noticed, um, since I shoot outside so often, uh, the X-T2 back screen will glare so much that I can't see anything unless I shoot to the viewfinder, which uh -huh. is fine because I mostly do that. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll want to shoot LCD or I'll want to, you know, review my images in there or whatever. And I do have, um, a little Hoodman loop that little thing that cups over the screen and, and gives you, a, you know, like a one-to-one -one magnification on your screen. So that actually is nice if you're outdoors. It just, basically, it's a little black screen that cups away the sun and blocks all the rays, and then you just stick your eye in a little magnifying glass, and you can see the screen at a one-to-one -one view. That's actually really nice for me. Yeah, um, and I and I would I, I can see where that would probably come in really handy for anyone that shoots outdoors. As a matter of fact, when I used to shoot Nikon, um, I, I used to uh, buy the loops that basically magnetically stuck on the back, you know, and you could easily pop them off. Um, they do make the camera an awkward, like, like design at, when yeah. you click that on or whatever. So yeah. it does look a little bit weird. Um, but I wish they, they would just, someone would create a really nice anti-glare, you know, screen protector or something. Uh, I agree. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. or even just the screen itself, if they could somehow make it, you know, much, just much less. I, I mean, again, everything is relative. So me coming from Sony, this thing is worlds better. Yeah. Then, yeah. because the the sun would just drown out the a sixty three hundred and the a sixty five hundred screen. I think I think it's because of the touch layer on the a sixty five hundred. I mean, it 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 was probably two stops darker than on the a sixty three hundred. It was really bad. Hey, that's crazy. Yeah, it well, was no good. Yeah. yeah. All right. So a couple more comments coming in. Let's see. Uh, UK Media says Fuji need a better version of the one hundred to four hundred with OIS and weather resistance. Um, I've never played with the uh, the 100 to 400. So, nor have uh, I. I wouldn't know, but I'm, I have heard a lot of good things about it. So, I'm not sure about that one. Um, Skipper says, as someone who goes to Japan quite a bit, there is no way anything made outside of Japan will be the same. The Japanese are the best work for small detail and quality. Definitely agree. Um, <clears throat> Eric Rossi says, wait, Sony overheats? <laughs> I guess, <laughs> guess he was responding to a comment. Of, uh, yeah. I've never even heard of that. Wait, what's, um, a, what is, what's an A9? I got to be honest, though. Like, I, I have yet to make my A6300 overheat. I don't know if it's just my way of shooting or whatever. I mean, I, I will get the little temperature warning light or whatever, but I've never made it overheat and shut down ever. So yeah, maybe I, I just got a good copy. Maybe there's some, you know, t tolerance variances or something in the manufacturing process, but I've never gotten mine to shut down. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the the talk about that can sometimes be just to get more views. And oh yeah, it's totally and, hyped up. That yeah, one camera I mean, guy, for, I'll name him. That one camera guy has been milking the A nine overheating stuff for you know <laughs> two ever since the damn camera came out. Yeah, and he's finally moved on. I guess everyone you know griped at him enough to to turn it loose. But I mean, he was hanging on to that for dear life, <laughs> trying to get those extra views. Yeah, I mean it. You know it. 
I brutal, never, brutal. I, I looked at that camera seriously because I, you know, every time any manufacturer comes out with something, I just look to see if it would fit in my workflow or just to take yeah. a look at it. And yeah, I mean, you know, of course there could be some banding issues, with the electronic shutter. Sure. I haven't played with the camera, so I can't say anything, but I've seen a lot of people like after that, that guy that made the video on it, I've seen so many people go out and put it through st like stress tests in the heat. Like I saw one guy, I can't remember his channel name, but he went to Phoenix, Arizona, like literally in the middle of the desert. He <laughs> set it, he set it on a rock in the middle of the desert just to shoot like a time lapse, and it did nothing. Like there was no overheating whatsoever. So yeah, you know, again, I think it could be maybe he got a bad copy. You know, I don't know, but. Yeah, it's, you know, you can't ever, until you see it repeat over and over, you know, you know if they found that, like, a million people had the same issue. Sure. Now, now I, have, I have played with the A9, and f being, a, being a, a Sony shooter for the last two and a half years, I can 100% say that the A9 is extremely well built. It feels very solid. The ergonomics are not so good with certain lenses because of the way the grip is. Um but as far as build quality, it's probably the best camera that they've ever made. I cannot, I, I, I put it through no stress tests as far as overheating or 4K video or anything like that. But um, no one on a grand enough scale had been complaining about it overheating or shutting down or anything else. But it is really bad press for Sony. And I think that's probably the reason that they released that last firmware update was to help get rid of those problems. Uh, at least with the temperature warning, they basically just pushed it back to, you know, what they find to actually be a safe operating temperature. I hope that that's the case. I right. hope that they're not just masking a real problem uh, instead of just pushing back a false positive where everyone go, well, see it already turned <laughs> yeah. on, you know, yeah. after, you know, 13 minutes of 4K recording in 108 <laughs> you know, just to get those guys to shut the hell up. You know, I hope that that's the case. Right. Yeah. I, and, I, and I agree with you. I think it, it looked like the camera was built like a tank. I mean, it looks really rigid, which is Extremely nice for mirrorless cameras. Extremely rigid. Yeah. Um, all right. A couple more comments came in. Uh, let's see here. Um, Andrea says, how many lenses can you fit in the Peak Design Messenger 15 going to Italy at the end of July? And I want to bring the 16 to 55. 55 to 200 and the 10 to 24 with the battery grip. Yep, all those would definitely fit. Uh, the nice thing about the Peak Design bag is it it stretches. And same with your backpack. I think they, they yeah, just, it's gusseted. So it, yeah, it all the free. slots kind of expand. There's no there's no empty space there. So you can like you can really make use of the space in the bag and the corners and their little slots like fold over each other. So you can stack lenses if you have the small little primes. So yes, all that will definitely fit in the messenger bag. And if you buy one that's brand new, the the new dividers um, have a brand new design. So they actually split two ways on each side. Um, so they're really, really miles better. Uh, it, now, I'm not 100% for sure if it's the same dividers in the messenger bag, though. I have heard a couple of people say that they the ones in the messenger bag were a little bit flimsy. But if I recall correctly, I seriously consider both the messenger and the backpack when I was in the store. I just happen to like backpacks better. But if I remember correctly, the new dividers were in the brand new messenger bags. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Cause I, I bought mine, like I bought mine, like on the Kickstarter project thing. When oh, okay. Came out. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and, and I agree. Mine are, mine are a little bit flimsier than I would like. I mean, like I would be afraid to stack the lint, like a heavy lens on top of another heavy lens. I just wouldn't do that. Right. Um, yeah. But, but you can, if you have like the small little, F, the F2 primes, um, all right. Uh, Scott Patterson says, good afternoon, all. Hello, Scott. Uh, Tim says, oh, man, more gear talk. Now peak design. This is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he means my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> right. <laughs> what exactly. he's no dude gives any shits unless they are <laughs> married or have a girlfriend that has nice, tight control on the finances. Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Um, Cine Nomine, gosh, I'm terrible at pronouncing names, uh, says, if you are a pixel peeper, you should see the prints. Uh, the, GS, the GFX gives you 104 inches by 83.61 inches. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, admittedly, I want the GFX just because you can. Well, I mean, obviously, who doesn't? Obviously. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, do I really need to spend 6500 bucks when I'm mainly getting away from client work and doing more teaching? No, I don't need a $7,000 camera to teach people how to take photos. Now if I, had, I could it, just, use, just use my phone. But. Yeah. I mean, if, if I had, if I had studio and it was nothing but in studio clients and they were all ending up in a magazine, then yeah, I would buy it in a heartbeat. But uh, even if you had a studio nine times out of 10, I would say probably, you know, over half 
over 75% of all your clients are pedestrian right off the street and any full frame or any APS-C camera, hell, even any one inch sensor micro four thirds with the right lighting and studio conditions, they would never know the difference. Yep, exactly. So, um, Tim says, ha, the wife, that's it. She's still not happy with me buying the X-T2 and the 50 to 140. <laughs> <laughs> See, I called it. I called nope. it. Um, all right, Adam Woodhouse says, don't worry, in eight years, you can buy the GFX for $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> that's just true. It's only eight years. Can't you wait? Jeez. I know. Well, okay, so let's talk about That's actually a good point. Before we wrap things up, let's talk about that. All there, right. there are, because I'm going to be doing a video kind of on this later. Uh, I got like so much flack when I bought the X-T1 as my second camera because again, so many people were wondering, why wouldn't you get the X-T20 or the X100F? The X-T1 is so old. Like just because something gets older throughout the years doesn't make it less good or less significant as a camera. Like the, the Nikon D700 and D3, wedding photographers still use those cameras because they're still good. Just because years go by doesn't make the cameras less good. You know, yeah, like, as a matter of fact, I've got some wedding, uh, wedding photographers that are still shooting with the D300. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I shot with the D300S for a long time. Yeah, I mean, and, th that uh, camera is still beast. I mean, it's what, 12 megapixels or something? Yeah, yep, 12. But it is, it is just stupid good for, for, for weddings. And it was like, what, half the price of the, um, uh, what was it, the D... What was it? now? Because the D300S actually came out before the D90. Yeah, because correct. because I was looking at some of their crop uh, bodies for as like my second camera, so that I could get the longer shots. If I if it was a really big church and I had to stay way far in the back, um, but yeah, the D three hundred S, my second shooter, would always bring a D three hundred, and as far as I know, still uses it to this day. Refuses yeah. to get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, there. So that that's what I always tell people that say like you know, Eric, how, how many megapixels do I need to print like a 20 by 30 print? That's probably the most common printing question I get. What is it? Eight like, megapixels? Yeah. And it, right. Cause it's <laughs> like, they think, you know, people think that 20 by 30 prints weren't being printed 10 years ago. You right. Know? Like <laughs> we've been, we've been printing 20 by 30 since before digital people you know, did it on film. So, you know, you, well, you, wow, can, print, yeah. you can print but a film solid is the book. You, you don't yeah, lose I mean, you, to a film. Yeah, you can print a solid, I would say like, if you have, let's say eight to 12 megapixels, you can print a solid 20 by 30 print from there as long as technique is correct. Your image is tack sharp, you know, the it's processed correctly, it's sharpened correctly. You're good Pro to, tip. You don't have to have 50 megapixels to get a 20 by 30 print. Pro tip, buy film, not megapixels because it doesn't translate the same. That's right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good tip. Yeah, the <laughs> megapixel war, you know, I mean, of course as a landscape photographer, megapixels are great, but now that I have the 36 megapixel D810 and 24 megapixel XT2, I don't really need any more pixels ever. I mean, I, you know, you are guaranteed future proof for at least the next decade. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's because again, the, our computer displays haven't really caught up yet on a consumer level. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, a couple more comments. Um, Eric Rossi says, I don't know about that, man. Fuji doesn't depreciate much. The Fuji X100 is still a few hundred bucks. That's actually a good point. That's true. It's, it's kind of Fuji. Like you said earlier, Fuji's kind of like Apple. You know, people are still selling like 2005 MacBooks for like 400 bucks, which is insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, that's true. I, I actually saw uh, the other day I was looking for a, um, uh, a Mac Pro, an older Mac Pro on Craigslist, and I saw a G4, an Apple G4 for like $350 without the display. And I was like, someone's going to buy that just for nostalgia because it has uh, an Apple absolutely. Logo. Absolutely, they will. Yep. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. The F Fuji doesn't really depreciate as much as the other brands. Because I, when I bought, I'll, I'll say this, when I bought the Sony A7R Mark II, uh, I paid 40, was it, what, what was it, $4,200 or something like that, or 38, I don't even remember. What was um, it? I don't. I don't remember what, the A7R Mark II. What was that when it was brand new? Oh, that was um, it was probably about thirty two, thirty four hundred. Oh. Okay, thirty. Okay, yeah. So I, I just remember I lost like eight hundred bucks when I sold it used, like two or three months later. I just couldn't get it back out of it. So, yeah, the same and it's same with like Windows computers. You know, with Apple, Fuji, they do hold their value well. Um, well, and you really want to also put this in perspective for everyone uh, if they're considering buying a new camera you know, or a new, or trying to buy in a new, a new system. It's more about the lenses. Uh, just, just know that, that, you know, the lenses are the window to your camera. And if the lenses don't render well, or if you buy invest in really good glass where the rendering's good, the micro contrast is good. The sharpness is good. The, the, the vignetting is low. The, you know, distortion is low. The, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, you're going to, 
future proof yourself because bodies come and go all the time. And that's the reason they end up being so cheap after just a little while is that no one gives a crap about the bodies. As long as they've got the good glass, they'll slap any new processor. That's all the camera is these days. It's a, yeah. it's a computer that holds your lens and the computer processes the image that comes through that glass. So buy good glass, swap your camera as often as you feel like it whenever the tech is upgraded. Period. That's right. Yeah. That, I mean, and I still need to do that video where I was going to do uh, like a, uh, again, Fuji doesn't make crappy lenses, but I was going to do like the kit lens on the, the X-T2 and like yes. the 16 when to 55. I know. And like the 16 to 55 on the X-T1 just to see yes. a sharpness difference. Because yeah, glass always, glass is the main focus. Correct. You, you can buy a five or six year old camera, but if you buy the best glass, you'll be, you'll get way better results. Yeah. I'll be watching that video for show. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious myself. I've never done anything like that, but I just know that glass is more important. All right, uh, a couple more questions here. Um, you got a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm watching. You need to catch up. I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, when charging the battery in the X-T2 and using the external battery grip with the plug in cord, does it also charge the internal battery? No. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think it does. You're right, yeah. No, I think it's just the grip. Um, do you oh, well, have... Unfortunately. Yeah, I know, but that would be nice to add. Maybe they, maybe they could do that in firmware. Yeah, maybe. And I, I honestly kind of think that uh, Fuji probably expected maybe some uh, pro photographers to maybe buy two grips and just keep them stacked with batteries so that when one's depleted, they can just screw a new one on with two batteries or buy multiple drawers. I don't know if you can do that or not for the battery grip, but maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder if you can buy just the, the drawers separate. Yeah, because um, you can charge, I think. Let me just double check since I got it sitting right here. No, you can't. Yeah, the, the charger's actually built into the grip, not the drawer. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's see here. Um, a couple more questions. Do you all plan to use any adapted lenses? Uh, curious which ones might interest you, Voigtlander, Leica, etc. That is uh, a good question. Yeah. Uh, do, do, you have, do you adapt any manual lenses? I think my screen went black for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe I'm having connection issues. Mm, let's see. Well, I mean, I, Minolta glass is cheap, and it's relatively good. Um, now, granted, it's not nearly as good as any Voigtlander or, um, you know, Leica lenses or anything. But, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned... For the price that you're going to pay for a lot of those older uh, manual style lenses, at least with, um, you know, old film glass, uh, you know, it, it's almost kind of worth it to get the higher performance of the autofocus on this camera by ba by buying native glass. Uh, I mean, you can adapt, you know, you know, old film glass on any mirrorless camera damn near. And it's almost cheaper for, you know, most photographers to just, you know shoot film if that's the case i mean that's what i would do but if i already had a huge large stock of old film glass absolutely i would i would immediately adapt it over just to see what kind of renderings i could get right yeah i've so the only thing i've adapted so far is the uh the nikon lenses over to the fuji film cameras and those it's been working out good okay um i think for some reason my screen keeps going black can you see me or am i having connection issues right now um, I can't see you, but what you could do is just turn your camera off real quick up at the top and then click it back yeah. on. It might, you might help you out. I mean, I can at least hear you now. There we go. Let's try this. All right. Sorry for the connection issues, everybody. I think I'm still streaming lovely. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> I'm going to have a nice chat with Comcast after this, apparently. <laughs> Give him a good scolding, Eric. I know. All right. Well, at least you can hear me. So, um, Eric Rossi says, peace, y'all. Great chat. Let's do a live sometime. The trio would be sick. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Uh, SC says, um, let's see. I'd really appreciate it, Mark and Eric, if you could help me on this before you wrap up. XT20, XT2, A6500, or the Olympus EM5 II for a passionate hobbyist take into account ergonomics and all that is rough, man. That is really rough. Yeah. Um, what do you shoot? you know, yeah. it, it would really depend on what you shoot. Um, I would say that any of those cameras are going to be fantastic as far as images, you know, just pure image quality. I mean, Olympus makes great glass, you know, Sony's got 
some decent glass in their full frame line, not so much in their APS-C line. The X-T2 and the X-T20 both have the same sensor, uh, the same processing engine. Um, and we all know that Fuji makes fantastic glass. Um, if you like Boca a whole lot, don't get the Olympus. Uh, if you like more Boca, the three APS-C size uh, cameras are probably going to be better. Um, yeah. But I would probably go for either the X-T20 or the X-T2 simply because of the lens choice. I agree. Yeah, the uh, I don't, and the, I don't know. I'm just not a big believer in the Micro Four Thirds system. Um, and as you can tell, because my screen is black and I apparently can't even show my face when I'm talking about it. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what the connection issue is. At least everybody can hear me. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a big believer in the Micro Four Thirds stuff. I've used it and I wasn't like overly impressed. So definitely stick Fujifilm. You just got to, you know, you just got to figure out between the X-T20 and the X-T2 you know, what, what works for you. Well, but. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying, though. I mean, it, it's all about the glass. So while I think that the A6500 is a fantastic camera in, in theory or whatever, they just don't have the APS-C glass to support it. And you'll probably end up spending probably 30 to 40% more for Sony uh, Sony's full-frame glass. Um, but if you like extremely lightweight and you like relatively cheap lenses, I mean, if weight is your biggest concern... You know, the Micro Four Thirds uh, lenses are super duper tiny and super duper light, but they're not super duper well made. They're a lot of them are plastic. So, right. I agree. All right. Well, uh, I guess I'm going to have to. Do you want to cover anything before we wrap it up? Because apparently I'm going to have to wrap it up on a black screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to hear that. No, I, I think I'm good. Um, All right. Cool. Well, uh, let us know in the comments since you guys are going to be viewing this at a later time. If you guys want to see more of these live chats, uh, apparently we're going to be doing a live chat with Eric Rossi soon, which will be awesome. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have any uh, other questions or anything, let us know in the comments and we will see you guys in the next video. Peace. Black screen. Thank <laughs> you.